I really like the original Game Boy. Not so much the physical hardware, seriously anything without a backlit screen at this point is a no for me, but more so the limited tech and restrictions that gave birth to some amazing creativity. The Game Boy is home to lots of interesting little gems, and its magic can't really be recreated anywhere else. I mean, yeah, you got the Game Boy Color, but that's kind of just an NES at that point, and there were clone consoles, but those for the most part feel like imitators. They just lack that special feeling Game Boy has. Its display was monochrome, but not black and white. It was green. It's such a small thing, but it changes how you perceive its games. I remember when I was playing Super Mario Land for the first time, I actually thought Mario was collecting peas and not coins. I never owned an original Game Boy growing up, but I still got exposed to its library through people loaning me games that I played on my Game Boy Advance thanks to backwards compatibility. When I got a 3DS in high school, I bought tons of Game Boy titles through the Virtual Console, and that was when I realized I had a fondness for the device. Some of my favorites include Quicks, Castlevania 2, Belmont's Revenge, Gargoyles Quest, Burger Time Deluxe, Bubble Ghost, Tetris Plus, and the Donkey Kong Land Trilogy. These are all good games, but everything I've mentioned has kind of been done to death, or it's an arcade game I could get four minutes worth of content out of. If I'm going to talk about a Game Boy game, I want to do something no one has really talked about before. And it's got to be green. Seriously, the green screen is way too iconic for the console. I guess tailgater but i don't own that one and i've never played it before surely there must be something else and then one day while i was doom scrolling through facebook i saw it an 8-bit screen of beautiful green kudzu a brand new game for the original game boy was live on kickstarter now i have a rule about kickstarter it's called no. I do not, under any circumstances, back Kickstarter projects. Even games I love, like Bloodstained, or ones that look really up my alley like Mina the Hollower, I do not back. I dislike video game pre-orders in the first place, but Kickstarter video games are like a pre-order you may never even get. I understand there have been many successful Kickstarter campaigns, but the site will never escape how many shady campaigns occur in the crowdfunding space. And for someone like me that doesn't know how to spot a crowdfunding scam easily, getting me to back one is a hard sell. But this is exactly what I'm looking for. Having a plant-themed game on a device with a green screen is too perfect of a fit. Surely it can't hurt to look, right? Oh wow, it's already 80% complete, and there's a demo too. Let's get that loaded up on the old Retroid Pocket 2S and give it a shot. It's just the first hour and there's a handful of glitches, but this is pretty good. I can see it's taking a bit of inspiration from Link's Awakening, but everything here is solid and it does a good job feeling like its own thing. Okay, how much does it cost to get the ROM file for this? I'm sold. So, before we really get into it, I want to discuss some things. First off, I'm kind of cheating with this one. Rose Tinted is specifically for games I've played in the past. Kudzu shouldn't qualify, but it perfectly fits the Game Boy specific criteria I set out previously. So I'm bending the rules a bit here. However, because I chose to do that, we have a new problem. For the first time, I am covering a new game. Despite my channel's size, I still have the ability to affect sales or people's experience with this game. So. I'm going to handle this one a little differently than normal. To be clear, everything I say here is my own opinion, and nobody paid me to make this review. I backed this project so I could talk about it for the channel. I'd also like to clearly state I played this through the Gambate Core in Retroarch on my Retroid Pocket 2S. I'm aware Retroarch typically introduces some emulation issues, so I've done some pretty thorough research regarding its quirks. When I address any technical issues with the game, I feel confident in saying they have nothing to do with my setup whatsoever. I'm also going to be spoiling a little bit, so here's some quick thoughts. Overall, I like the game a lot, and there's tons of good stuff here, but it's got a lot of technical issues. It's sad because they come close to spoiling the experience, but the good stuff is so good, it ends up overcoming most of it. I do recommend this game to people who like Game Boy games, but you should be aware that this may be its final state. From what I've researched, this project appears to be finished, so it is what it is. And that's sad, because if it had had a few more months pumped into it, it would have gotten to a very excellent state, be an easy recommendation, and I would be raving about it. But as it is, it's just good. And despite all of that, it's still pretty impressive as a first-time project. 
If you're still interested in this game, I'd go ahead and shut the video off now. I'll stick an ad break here so people have time. So I guess the best way to get things started is with the Kickstarter campaign itself. From what I can tell, this game started development sometime before December 17th, 2020. I say that because it's the very first of many update logs on the game's itch.io page. On July 15th, 2022, the developer, Chris Totten, announced that Kudzu had secured a publisher for physical copies through Mega Cat Studios, along with plans for a crowdfunding campaign that fall. And then, literally nothing for like... a year? And then the Kickstarter campaign launched on May 25th, 2023. The campaign hit its funding goal after just 12 hours and ended up totaling out at $46,195 from 866 backers. I was backer number 277, so I got to it pretty early. I backed the early bird seedling tier for 15 bucks, which included a copy of the game's ROM file, the game's soundtrack, and a PDF of the game's manual. And that's the first thing I really want to talk about. This is a good manual. It's in full color and feels exactly like a manual I would have gotten with one of my Game Boy Advance games back in the day. I kind of miss reading these, honestly. Anytime I'd have stuff taken away for misbehaving, I'd read them front to back. They have this certain feel to them that I think is becoming a bit of a lost art. The Kudzu manual nails this. The flavor text describing everything does a good job getting your imagination flowing. I also really like the drawings of all the characters in the game. In particular, I like this one of the Kudzu route. They perfectly match their sprite counterpart. The manual's quality, and I assume people that back the physical editions are very happy with it. The Kickstarter campaign overall went very smooth. I saw some people overseas have shipping issues, but that's to be expected in my opinion. The team managing the Kickstarter is quick to address anything that pops up. I even baited them by asking for something I didn't think was their responsibility, and they responded with a real answer, which was very kind of them. I personally think they went above and beyond to deliver a good product on their end. Kudzu, as Chris describes it, is a non-linear adventure game. You play as Max, a student of Master Gardener Zoan, whose research group is studying a particularly invasive species of kudzu. One day, Max heads out to bring Zoan his morning tea, only to find he's vanished, and your journey begins there. In real life, kudzu is an invasive species that grows incredibly fast and attempts to take over any area it pops up in. Thus, the game thematically has a large focus on gardening and nature. It's a perfect fit for a game console with a green tinted screen, so we're already off to a great start. This demo is pretty fantastic. It lets you play a little bit past the game's first boss. It does an excellent job of enticing the player, and by the time it was over, I just wanted more. It might actually be the most effective demo I've ever played, second only to the one for Dragon Quest Builders 2. I think this may be because it's ticking all the right boxes for me. It's clearly drawing inspiration from Link's Awakening, and I'm a huge fan of the Game Boy Zeldas. But it's not enough to be an imitation of something. You have to understand what makes that original thing tick, and how to do it yourself. And Kudzu gets that. The game has a really thoughtful design that makes it easy for the player to figure out what they need to do next. And it also has fun characters, dialogue, and flavor text that makes the world a joy to explore. There were a few things in the demo I didn't like, though. I thought the sprite and hitbox for Max's attack animation was a little small, but it's on par with the sword attack from the original Legend of Zelda. We'll come back to that a bit later. When you destroy one of the kudzu roots for an area, you get a message saying how many there are left. Pretty useful, but when you destroy the final one, you get the same message just saying there are zero left. I didn't care for this, and felt like destroying the final kudzu route should have had a little more fanfare. These are nitpicks, and not something that actually matters at the end of the day. I only saw one thing that actually mattered, and that had to do with the boss, the kudzu bug queen. She's a large entity that's made up of four different sprites, and because of that, sometimes you can see the seams that put her together. Apparently, this was a limitation of GB Studio at the time, but it's still worth mentioning. I was really into this game up until this point, and seeing her split like that took me right out of it. Problems like this are a disappointment, but understandable. Overall, Kudzu's demo left a very positive impression on me, and having to wait months to get my hands on my copy was torture. 
That would come to an end when I received my copy on January 5th, 2024. It was finally time to fully dive into the world of kudzu, and I was excited. Little has changed from the demo outside of some game-breaking bug fixes, so I'm gonna discuss a few things I didn't go over yet. Kudzu's music was made by Brandon Ellis, and it is fantastic. The music unanimously fits every area it is heard in. There are a small amount of tracks that get recycled, but it's always done in a fitting manner they really know how to make the most out of what they have to work with. When you finally get the key to unlock the gate at the end of the first area, the music actually cuts out, making the event more impactful. Good stuff. They also made the decision to not have sound effects. In Game Boy games, sound effects use the same audio channels that the music does, so they can overpower the music when they play. The music for this game is very good, so I'm glad they made the decision to not interrupt it with sound effects. Although, a few more would have been nice. The main one I know of is for when you pick up items enemies have dropped, which I feel is totally necessary. Most other actions have a visual indicator of what's going on, but items you pick up off the ground just disappear. It's not exactly clear what's going on right here. Picked up items go in your inventory where they can be used. It kind of goes against what players would naturally expect, them not being used instantly upon picking them up, but the game does a good job of making sure you're aware of this through the sound effect that plays, and by placing tutorials for it in the early areas. When Max takes enough damage, you'll get an indicator on screen that you have one or two hit points left. At the start of the game, you'll only have a max of four, or 100 HP as the menu says. I'm referring to hit points as increments of 25 HP. The kudzu jelly you find is kept in these jelly slots. Each jelly slot can hold up to three units, healing you for a total of 75 HP. When you're on the pause screen, you can select the jelly slots and press A to consume three units, or whatever you've got left. So for the most part, you're restricted to healing 75 HP at a time. In the beginning of the game, this means waiting till you can only take one more hit, which makes the game slightly more difficult. I was initially frustrated by this, but I noticed once I adapted to the difficulty curve, the game stayed fairly consistent until the very end of the game, despite any upgrades I received. So, I'm going to talk about something new today that I admittedly don't have a ton of confidence or experience in, but I'm going to go for it because it's a nice way to encompass a few different points. Kudzu has some great world building expressed through its character dialogue, flavor text, and graphics. Remember when I said it's not enough to be an imitation, you have to understand what makes the original tick? Link's Awakening feels like being stranded on an uncharted island despite the Game Boy's limitations. There are beaches, small villages with quirky locals, overgrown jungles, and large areas from a bygone era that have fallen into ruin. Kudzu does an equally excellent job establishing its own world. The game has fantastic sprite work in general, but I noticed throughout multiple points in the game you'll enter a room with an asset not seen anywhere else. This room is by far my favorite. It takes place in this forest that is so overgrown with kudzu that it blocks out most of the light from the sun. When you enter this screen, there is only a single goat to collect, but behind them is this abandoned cabin that has been reclaimed by nature. As far as I know, this exact visual is not seen anywhere else in the game. The game's script represents this as well. Many of the characters are amusing, but there's also a level of serious moments regarding the threat the kudzu poses. After I beat this boss in the garden, you run into this statue in the next room that's holding something. Then the ghost of this gardener appears, they talk to you for a bit, and you get the garden hoe tool. After the little cutscene ends, I check the statue. This gardener has already given you their former tools. Let them rest in peace. And then it hit me. This isn't a statue, it's the remains of someone that failed to stop the kudzu before you. This is the fate that awaits you if you fail. I actually stopped for a minute while that set in. The game hadn't been super serious up until this point, but this was when it started to set in how dangerous this stuff really was. I understood why Zoan left unannounced before the start of the game. It gave me motivation to keep going. Again, 
talking about this sort of thing isn't my strong suit, but I wanted to make sure I mentioned it. But that's enough of that. I want to start talking about the level design because that's much more my speed. The game exists in this big circle with a few offshoots. You'll basically loop around to the research camp at the beginning once you explore the bulk of the game. There are distinct areas, but they blend really well through the use of these transition scenes. However, there's no fast travel of any kind. Part of the course for a Game Boy title, but there's no way to cut across if you're on the other side of the circle. There's some shortcuts, yeah, and puzzles stay completed after you solve them, but it's inconvenient if you want to backtrack to upgrade a kudzu jelly slot or claim a reward. I ended up using fast forward on my emulator to save myself time. They should have had something like an archaeologist that lets you pay to access his tunnels for moving around easier. I will say this. The first time you loop back around to the research camp, most of the residents have moved around with new things to say. It made navigating back here give me a sense of progression. In terms of the design of individual rooms or larger areas, I noticed the game distributes rewards exactly when they would be their most useful. At one point while exploring the garden, I desperately needed health and came across a large kudzu jelly in a chest. This chest's item is the same regardless of what's going on, but it's like they knew I might be getting low on resources around this part. As I played on, it became really obvious that Chris undoubtedly knows what he's doing when it comes to designing a room both visually and functionally. So many of the rooms look great just from the sprite work and design alone. There's even signposting for boss fights, which is much appreciated. However, there was one single room in the entire game I didn't care for. In the forest area, there's this tall room that starts with a barrier in the middle you can walk around on either side. It ends with this zigzag path to get out of it. There's a few enemies firing seeds at you from above, and you have to dodge them throughout the majority of the room. There's a single enemy that moves, so the challenge here is mainly navigating around all the obstacles. Best plan is to hug the inside barrier on either side, take out or dodge the moving enemy, then time how you work your way through the zigzag part. The paths you have to take are pretty narrow, but you have enough space to make it through. There's also no reason to go past the two flowers firing seeds on either side, because there's just a wall there. Doesn't sound too bad, right? Yeah, so here's what the room actually looks like. There's this gap on the other side that looks like you can go there to dodge the seeds, but if you try, you'll hit an invisible wall and end up getting hit. This isn't great because that space tricks the player. I probably wouldn't care too much if this room wasn't a frequent backtracking spot. There's also a room a bit before this that has a similar design and uses the same tree stump sprites on the sides, but communicates the available space a lot better. This room isn't great, but thankfully it's one of the rare missteps in this game from a design standpoint. Chris clearly states that Kudzu is inspired by Link's Awakening, but outside of a few nods and winks, Kudzu feels like its own thing. However, the combat is an almost one-to-one -one match to that in the original Legend of Zelda. And it's actually done a little worse here. You can move up, down, left, and right in one-fourth squares and attack a single tile directly in front of you. This means all the combat relies on watching enemies and waiting for openings, or making sure you approach them from the correct side. If you're careless, enemies can rip through your health really easily, and I've noticed sometimes their attacks don't have cooldowns. Whenever you take damage, you'll get knocked back to signify you've taken a hit, and man, it's honestly pretty jank. If you're holding any direction, it'll often cause it to not work properly, completely destroying the intended feedback. It leaves you being bounced around constantly like your character is a pinball. I've played other GB Studio games with the same problem, but this should have been addressed. Taking damage in rapid succession is way too common and it ends up harming the rather interesting healing mechanic. To heal, you have to enter the menu, which activates its other function. Resetting the entire room. This is to avoid getting trapped by puzzles, but it also resets enemy locations unless you already killed them. It also doesn't reset their health, allowing you to get in cheap hits and cheese a lot of fights. Initially, I thought this wasn't intended, but this sign in the garden makes it clear this is what they were going for. It's worth noting this is something that's actually programmed directly into the engine for GB Studio, and 
I'm a little confused why, because it's kind of bad. I guess in this game it's kept balanced because it can harm you as well. Opening the menu also erases any items defeated enemies have dropped. So if they drop some kudzu jelly and you want to heal or confirm your status before grabbing it, you can't. You just lose it entirely. Not necessarily bad, just something to get used to. Because taking hits is an inevitability, you'll want to upgrade your kudzu jelly reserves as soon as you can. This can be done by giving pokeweed leaves to Ethel at her diner. Pokeweeds are one of the main collectibles of the game that there's a set amount of, so if you want all four slots, you need to find every last leaf. You can find them in various places, but the main source of them is pokeweed monsters. These guys can be found in rooms off the beaten path and will fight you before giving up their precious leaves. I like the idea of having to fight a little mini-boss to get a highly valuable item, but sadly, the execution is not great. These guys are the most jank enemy in the entire game. They swing this ball around and the idea is you gotta time your attacks correctly in between their rotation. But because of the lack of diagonal movement, it's difficult to get in there without abusing some post-hit invincibility. These guys are like an immobile version of the ball and chain enemies from The Legend of Zelda. Well, mostly immobile. Some of them move around, but it's way too rigid. This type of enemy works in Zelda because their fights become dynamic with their movement, but you also have a circular attack of your own. It feels skill-based there. This is just a trial and frustration. Until you realize you could just stand inside them and keep wailing on them. Once I figured this out, it's the only thing I did. I didn't even bother trying to fight them legit. Everything regarding these guys doesn't work and should have been tossed out entirely or given some serious attention to get them in proper working order. It's sad because some of their arenas are different and I noticed they take the same amount of damage regardless of weapon upgrades. These could have been interesting, but as it stands, they're just a mess. Something that also could have potentially been a mess is the additional content added by the Kickstarter stretch goals. I've seen this affect games in very negative, ill-fitting ways, in my opinion. I can almost immediately tell when something was included in a game because of a Kickstarter campaign. My favorite one I've seen was the Hall of Heroes in Shovel Knight. I eventually realized what that area was, but that one didn't really bother me too much. Kudzu did really well with its additional Kickstarter content, and honestly, I don't think it would be the same without it. We got three things, a fishing minigame, an extra dungeon, and a second final boss with a new ending. The fishing minigame is less fishing and more of an arcade style game. The goal is to guide the hook into the fish while avoiding the rocks. If you get hit once, it's all over, and you get paid mushrooms based on how many fish you catch. My highest score was 126 mushrooms. I'm glad this was a literal minigame and not actual fishing, because I'm kind of sick of games doing that. It's a bad trope at this point. The fishing minigame is also the only place you can find the tin can item, which lets you get one of the collectible goats. Collecting these guys nets your reward for every five you collect, and there was a backer tier where you would get one named after you. However, there wasn't 20 backers for this tier, so not all the goats are named. After you find 15, you get this compass that directly tells you where the other five goats are. There's also another compass for this like pokeweed leaves, so the game does an awesome job making sure you're able to collect everything. I wanted to point this out specifically because it's super appreciated by me, and it's something that very few actual Zelda games bother to do. A bonus dungeon along with a new final boss and ending were the last content stretch goals. I'm going to talk about them together because I feel like had they been omitted, the game would have been significantly worse for it. The bonus Kickstarter dungeon will unlock the second ending of the game once completed. This dungeon is named Secret Shed. Like most endgame areas, it does a fantastic job utilizing most of the game's mechanics in creative ways. The music here is also particularly excellent. Once it's cleared, you can no longer access the normal ending on this playthrough. I'm not going to spoil it, but I like the extra boss a lot and think it puts a nice bow on everything. And honestly, had the game not had these two bonuses, I think it would have felt skeletal and anticlimactic. They fit so well, in fact, initially I thought we got lied to and these were always in the game and not real stretch goals. Like somebody just dumped a ton of money in to make sure they were met. But in the copy of the game's OST I got, the music for Secret Shed is actually labeled 
Mountain, which is the final area of the game. Things were clearly shaken up a bit because of the campaign, but they did an excellent job at making the new stuff fit perfectly into place. I have been very positive up until this point, and for good reason. There's a lot of things worth praising in Kudzu, especially for a first project. But to be honest, this video is pretty hard to make. Kudzu is a good game, potentially even a great one, but initially it disappointed me. On the Kickstarter page under the Risks and Challenges section, there is a sentiment expressed that I wholeheartedly agree with. Making a game is never an easy task. Making one for an older console brings an additional level of challenge. Rather than kickstarting the game in its earliest stages, we decided to bring it to the community later in development. The game engine is over 90% completed, and the current game build itself over 70%. We're excited to use this campaign to boost the signal and amplify the community engagement for playtesting and polish to make Kudzu the best it can be. This put the idea in my head that the difference in quality between the demo and the final product would be pretty large, but that's not actually the case. Initially, when I first got the game, I noticed some issues that remained from the demo. For starters, the pause menu sucks. I like the idea, but it constantly misses inputs, meaning anytime you want to open it to heal or check your items, it's a battle getting the game to highlight what you want. The Kudzu Bug Queen also sadly still splits apart. This was just the tip of the iceberg, and as I played through the game, I steadily noticed more and more issues and became very disappointed. This game that I had been set up to have specific expectations for was not living up to them. I finished the game and started on this script. And honestly, I had a pretty rough time not letting my emotions override my objectivity. But I wanted to do a good job, so I looked into things to the best of my capability. I tested other GB Studio titles with my emulation setup and found some common issues. I could safely discard those as an outside factor and not a problem with the game itself. Then I collected everything I felt was relevant and listed it out, finished the script up, and sat on everything for a few days. And gradually, new information trickled out, and I started to understand this game more. And then I basically rewrote this entire section. Three whole times, in fact. I initially listed out most of the issues I ran into, but there's no point in that. The game has glitches, but the majority of them aren't major. Those, for the most part, have been fixed. From what I can tell, a huge chunk of the issues come from the game being developed using a beta of the GB Studio engine. A lot of the things I complained about can't actually be fixed without moving to a newer version, or a heavy amount of work. It took me a while, but I get what's going on now. Kudzu started as a simple project by one person that got bigger and bigger until it grew out of control, which is incredibly ironic considering the plant it's named after. Remember, this was just a little indie game on itch when it started. The Kickstarter came in way later and was mainly for physical releases and a Switch port. And overall, I think it made the game better because it added some much needed content. However, knowing all that doesn't mean I'm going to sweep it under the rug. Plus, I still have a video to make. I'm not going to detail most of the technical issues out of respect, but their existence will impact the overall final score. I would like to talk about some of them, however. This first one is more of an oversight. This last friendly NPC that appears in Ethel's Diner doesn't actually have any dialogue. I like to think they're too busy eating. I bring this one up because it displays the lack of polish the later parts of the game have, which is where the other two glitches occur. The boss for the forest area is Soledego the Seed Sniper. A lot of the bosses in Kudzu are more puzzle-based, and Soledego is one of my favorites. However, when I first beat him, I encountered this glitch where his defeat text box displayed twice. I almost thought this was intentional, like the Kudzu was fully taking him over, but something felt off. I ended up resetting and doing his fight over, and I was absolutely right to be suspicious. After you beat him, the screen shakes and the game tells you a gate you ran into earlier may have opened, which didn't happen the first time. Because I reset, I don't actually know if this was game breaking or not. And lastly, it's possible to get infinite goats. I know for a fact this isn't caused by any issues with my setup because somebody else reported it besides me. 
I gotta be honest, I'm not sure how to feel about this one. Because you can cheese the goat counter, the compass showing their locations is less valuable. So, that's kinda lame. On the flip side, it let me get the Master Machete early, and I got to use it for Secret Shed because of that. Once you remove the frustration caused by the jank combat, it lets you appreciate how much thought was put into the game's overall design. But, it also made me feel Secret Shed, as well as the Mountain, were kinda short because I mopped the floor with everything. At the end of the day, I'm not sure how to feel about this one. I think it's pretty subjective, but it's worth pointing out regardless. While I commend Chris for putting so much effort into bug squashing as a single dev, it's not as much as the game needs. This game is in a completable state, you can totally play through it and enjoy it, but I'd be aware that you can run into some issues. Just save often and don't expect perfection, and you'll be fine. Overall, I think Kudzu is pretty great, but it sabotages itself with how unpolished the back half is. Seriously, there's an entire area I made an effort not to talk about because it's easily the best part of the whole game. I don't want to spoil it on the off chance some people that want to play it are still watching. The game deserves praise, but I'm not going to sit here and pretend like it doesn't have problems. I think it's also a prime example of why the one-man army approach doesn't always work for game development. It's similar to Mastema in that way. Both of these are good games at their core, but they're let down by the pitfalls of single-person development. Not everyone is Eric Barone or Toby Fox, and there's nothing wrong with that. I give Kudzu a 6.75 out of 10, reminder that my average is at 5 and not 7 like most reviewers. If the game didn't have any oversights or minor technical issues, it would be an 8. There's still a lot to love here, just remember to see the forest for the trees. For anybody asking for a new Game Boy title, it feels right at home on the system. Just save often and be prepared for some hiccups. Considering it's a project from a single person, and a new developer at that, I'm very impressed. In my opinion, Chris shows a lot of promise as a game developer. I've also noticed that he's been working on a game called Little Nemo and the Nightmare Fiends, and given what I learned about the pitfalls in Kudzu's development, and the genuine prowess Chris has shown as a game designer, I get the feeling this next game is going to hit that excellent status he got so close to achieving here. It's also nice to see someone using a recently public domain property in a faithful and respectful way, instead of just using it as fodder for some crappy horror game. If you like this video, leave me one below. If you've got anything to say, let it bloom in the comments. And if you subscribe, you can even be here for next time.